Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First things first, please turn off your cell phones. Take them out, look at them, and make absolutely sure they're off. Also, please don't use, if you're going to take Im images of the slides, please don't use flash photography. It's very disturbing for everyone, including the lecturer. And now, before I int introduce the, our lecturer, Hilary Guys, um, if you want to look at her artwork, you must go to her website, and it's simply hilaryguys.com. Okay? It is now my privilege to introduce Hilary to you. Some of you will have been at the first course, so you will have heard either this or something similar. Um, but let me just tell you about her very briefly. Um, Hilary Guys is currently on the faculty of Florida State University. She has toured widely in the United States and worked for universities in North Carolina and Montana and has lectured for the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C. She's also told me this is her eighth time here. And with luck, we will have her back. I will work on her next year. Um, she is based in London. She received her postgraduate degrees in ancient history and classic Greek art from Burbeck College and the University College London. She is a well-known lecturer for the National Decorative and Fine Art Societies and for the Art Fund. She tours the United Kingdom and continent regularly. She also taught courses for Cambridge University and most recently for the University in Aix-en-Provence on Romanesque and Gothic art. She's also a guest speaker on the Swan Hellenic Cruises. Please welcome Hilary Guys. I saw some people smiling when they saw the gesture of the hand and the very place that it's positioned, all very interesting. It's not an act of modesty, it's actually an advertisement, but we'll come to that in a minute. I was just thinking, the, the thing that you know the most and the best is your own body. You probably know your own body better than anything else on the planet, don't you? Is it a surprise then that, that, that figure art has dominated art from the very beginning for centuries and centuries? In ancient Greece, there's no landscape painting at all. I mean, why bother? Poor landscape was really the Cinderella of the arts for centuries until the 17th century, when it was pretty much invented by Claude Lorraine. Uh, that'll have to be another talk, I think. But the point is that we are fascinated with our own bodies. What can we do? You know, we send signals, we suffer through our bodies, we express joy through our bodies, and we are fascinated with other people's bodies, and therefore we're interested in figure art. So what we're going to do today and tomorrow is we're going to look at figure art in the late 19th century through the eyes of the great artists of the period, and I'm going to try and untangle some of the signals if I can. Um, when you look first of all at this painting by Corbe, you get the idea that the artist is the maestro and the person standing behind the artist is a sort of thing, a sort of object, a sort of stage prop. I mean, she's naked, but well, not, not, you don't see her as naked because you don't see her as a woman. She is a stage prop with her, her, her drapes, fetchingly draped in the classical mode while he paints, oddly enough, a landscape. So uh, it's, called, it's called a real allegory. And if you're on your toes, you'll realize a real allegory is a very nice oxymoron. It can go into my collection of oxymorons. When you look at the whole painting by Corpe, and he is from Orno in Jura, and he was well, the great realist in the middle of the 19th century in France, you see that he sees himself as the first player on a theater, a stage, the artist studio is a stage, it's a theatrical place where theatrical things happen, where images are invented, and the people that are there are part of the cast. 
It's quite different from what happens with the Impressionists, particularly Monet, where the painting happens somewhere else, and he just records it. The sun moving and the clouds passing and the shadows changing make the painting. He responds to it, doesn't impose himself on it. So that was the biggest shift. In the middle of the 19th century and before that, art happened in a studio, and in the studio you would find the model, and the model would be a thing, um, obviously, and she'd be paid, so she's just a sort of object. So this is the painting by Corbet, um, setting himself at the center of this whole scenario. So this painting gives you a very good idea of the concept of a studio in the classical um, Parisian sense, a salon painter, his name is Jean um, Jerome, and he is making a sculpture in marble, which will have a classical title, and he's doing it from a girl who is sitting dead still and is utterly decontextualized, utterly desexualized. Um, it must be very horrible to sit with your hand out like that for hours, but he's clearly not seeing her as anything other than um, a replica that he can copy in marble. I mean, I see this painting and I snigger as utterly having no artistic merit whatsoever, really. Um, but it, it's there and it tells you something about the attitude of painting in the studio. I, I do think he's going to step back and fall off his plinth and she's going to go in the other direction. I can just see that about to happen. It also has its very au moment to have this pale Prussian blue on the apron. You see that on the Countess de Sonville by Ingres, and you see it on lots of paintings of the late 18th century. You see it in Gainsborough. It was the new fashionable color. So this whole thing, this whole thing, um, is evoking the sense of what art really is in Paris in the salons. Um, then, oh, thank goodness for mythology, because mythology opens up all sorts of erotic possibilities. Um, we're looking at another very important salon painter called Adolf William Beaujeroux, and this painting is called The Birth of Venus. I hope you can read all my notes, can you? Very good, thanks. So, Birth of Venus, um, here you see Venus Aphrodite rising from the water. She is standing on a shell, and she's born from the foam of the sea, from, in fact, the sperm of Poseidon, or Zeus, not quite sure who her father was, um, floating around in the, in, the, in the foam off the island of Cyprus. That's why she's called the Cyprian in some poetry. So Aphros means foam, therefore Aphrodite is her name. But here she is in Paris, and she's very much showing off her stuff. It's an attitude of display, isn't it? It's a complete attitude with her arm up, the hair is really insanely long, coming right down to here. And she's in very close proximity to some rather muscular and swarthy male flesh, which would be totally and utterly unacceptable in the real world. But don't worry, it's fine, because she's a Greek goddess and nothing to do with us. And the painting style is absolutely extraordinary. It's what I call the silken world of Michelangelo. But it's very, very fluid. And he used um, sable brushes, of course, the biggest change between these painters, the salon painters, and what were called the new painters, who were the impressionists, they used hog hair brushes. So they got scratchy um, brush strokes, and that's really one of the biggest differences. Um, I've said that she was mythological and not real, but actually, she was real, and she was deeply, deeply aristocratic. Her name was Marie Georgine, Princess of Lang, and she was from Brabant in Brussels. She was a real, live, true aristocrat from very ancient line. And she met Bougeron in about um, 1861, and she, she modeled for this painting with her lover. There we are. So it was really a real person. But when you look at the figure, you see this incredible silky surface it was the one thing that, on the one hand, made it immensely popular at the time, but also killed the art when the Impressionists came in. I mean, the young painters used to joke that when William Bergerot went to, have a, went to go, in, go into the loo, he would lose so many francs because he just painted night and day and he charged pretty much so much per square foot. 
So he was very much sneered at by the young painters. But even if you couldn't see the face of the girl and the face of the man that tell you it's a modern painting, I think you'd know something by looking at this. You'd know something that somehow it isn't classical, even though it spars to be classical. The point about these, this talk that I'm doing today is I'm going to discuss how, how the artist abandoned the classical canon. We're going to move from classical to anti-classical. And tomorrow we're going to go from anti-classical to barbarism or to primitivism. So we're looking at, at, at Botticelli's Birth of Venus, which of course is a model for the painting. And we see that Botticelli is there, again perched on her shell. It's so much more subtle. She's not strutting her stuff with her arm above her head. And her hair is modestly draped around her. And of course she's very beautiful and very peaceful. She's quite wonderful, actually. She's probably modeled on Simonetta Catania, who was the most beautiful girl in Italy at the time. But when we look at her, we can see, just to say, that her body expresses what's called contraposto, which is a serpentine movement of the body. Now, just to remind us what is contraposto, let's go back to the age before contraposto and look at the Egyptians. So these Egyptian sculptures show you the, 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 the shoulders are horizontal and the hips are horizontal. The one foot is forward in a sort of walking position, but they're not really walking. And that attitude, that static attitude, is what predates the invention of contraposto in the fifth century in Greece. If I show you probably the very first example of contraposto, he's called the Critios boy, or the Critios boy, He's found on the Acropolis in the 5th century. And you can imagine him posing for some sculptor and getting really tired and just sagging a bit like that. And suddenly the sculptor sees the rhythm. Um, of course, if, you are on, if you've got your weight on one foot and the weight is coming down the inside of the weight-bearing leg, this knee will bend, the hip will go up on that side, the shoulder will go in the other direction, and the head will turn as well, like that. Well, it, you can't help it waiting for the bus and you go, everybody goes into Costa Ponte waiting for the bus. So this contraposto is really a key idea which goes on right through uh, the Renaissance. And it gives life to the figures. It also means they're not walking. You can't walk if you're doing contraposto. So come back here and we can see the Botticelli Primavera and the pa painting from which Bougereau got his idea came from classical models on this side is the Medici Venus, which he probably would have seen, Botticelli. And here is the Venus de Milo, which Botticelli, sadly, would not have seen, because she was only found in 1820. And again, with the, with the Venus de Milo, you see a much more extreme serpentine attitude. So the serpentine attitude, if I may say, introduces the possibility of Orientalism. It's not your clean-cut, straightforward, eyes-front feeling. There's something sinuous, something exotic about it. And um, we look then at the Eugene Delacroix because it gives us another model, another model, which is the reclining odalisque, which becomes, of course, a great feature of art in the 19th century. This one is by Delacroix, and he cites his scene in the Orient. It is inside a harem. Uh, there is a male... Um, eunuch standing in the background, his servant, who will be protecting the harem, and a lute player playing to her, and she looks very sated and relaxed. And this is a truly erotic image. And she's not a goddess, but don't worry, she's not one of us, because she's quite clearly in a Muslim harem. Eugene Delacroix, like very many 19th century poets and writers and artists, were completely mesmerized by the East. So we're going to see this pattern. Now, when photography is invented, the, which happened around 1842, first camera, we find artists and photographers trying to do the classical figures. So we're going to see some. Now, these are some very early photographs. And you see that this photographer has objectivized the woman. It's a pretty erotic sort of pose. Um, the head is up with the throat exposed. Was anybody here, has anybody was here during the week when I talked about Ophelia? 
Right, Ophelia had the erotic zone of her neck exposed. Plus, this woman is holding a tambourine. Well, that's a complete sign of her complete and utter abandon. I mean, tambourines go with minads, minads go with ecstatic, you know, extreme behavior. So she's shown here reclining on the sofa, arm up, and um, in a very erotic way. But somehow it just looks totally modern, doesn't it? It doesn't achieve anything classical at all. When we come back to Gustav Courbet, who was the bad boy of art in the 19th century, um, as somebody said, he should have said, I offend, therefore I am. Everything he did was deeply offensive. Um, he made this painting of two girls lying on the side of the River Seine. But that was okay, except it wasn't, because they're dressed in modern dress, they are ordinary prison girls, and the girl in the foreground is, is sleeping in a very, very suggestive attitude. Everybody could see it. You look at the hands, the eyes are half closed. You have no difficulty in seeing that this was a highly offensive painting at a time when women couldn't show the insides of their wrists, um, couldn't go out or meet men on their own, and all the rest of it, unless they were milliners. And of course, there were thousands of milliners, all of them. Amazingly, Paris was full of milliners. So um, this painting by Colbert is beginning to ease into the real world with ideas that are going to shake, shake society um, by painting women in this sort of way, which is quite erotic, but not making any reference to the um, classical model. Are you all with me? Do you understand? Try and say, I'm going a bit fast. I'm sorry about that. Um, but please slow me down if you want to. Just slow me down. Um, so, it gets much worse, by the way, but just to, to sort of ease you gently into the idea, we come to Manet. Manet, of course, is the great, great master, uh, one of the greatest painters I think has ever lived. And when in my list, and I have a very short list of people I want, would like to have lunch with, he is right at the top of that list. I have to say that Vincent van Gogh is not on the list at all. I think he'd upset me so much, I couldn't bear it. But Manet is wonderful, and as for Apollinaire, Apollinaire is right at the top of the list, but I'd have to prize him away from that awful Mary Lorenzon, who was his mistress. I don't think I'd have much difficulty, actually. I think she's a bit of an airhead. But here is Manet, wonderful man that he was, um, a great um, man of Paris with his top hat and his clothes, and he was much better born than all the others in that group. And there's a painting by Fantin Latour showing him very fit and healthy and very young. Now, he really was the pivotal figure in the transition from idealism to realism and then to impressionism. What I've introduced you to so far is the concept of idealism based on classical models, which we saw in the first couple of paintings, going through to Courbet, the realism, and then finally to Impressionism. And he does it. Now, when we look at this painting, this girl is sitting in the, I don't know, Tuileries Garden somewhere. And he, Manet is one of the very first painters to approach modern life subjects. You know, we're so used to seeing these, we don't understand the impact they made. First of all, this girl, she's dangerous because she is outside alone. We know she's alone because she's reading a journal, right? We know she's outside because she's wearing, come on everybody, hat and gloves, very good. Secondly, is she reading the journal or looking above the journal, over the journal, looking over the journal? And goodness me, she can read. And she's reading a journal and could have political articles and the next thing is she's going to want the vote. So it was extremely worrying when paintings of this sort started to come out. Um, the, the style is completely broken and modern and avant-garde and was, and was totally appalling to all the great um, aficionados of the salon. It certainly didn't have what we might call the perfect diction that we saw in the work of Bougereau, which I call the silken word of Michelangelo, it didn't have that. He is painting with different kinds of brushes from the brushes that Bougereau used. So let's look at the Dogenet. I know it's so wonderful to come to Cape Town, you all know these paintings. 
Um, when we look at the Dogenet Suleb, we see that the nude has now come out of the studio and into the parks of Paris. That's not supposed to happen. And this painting was made in 1863, and it was sent to the salon where, of course, it was refused, along with about two-thirds of the other works that year. And so another salon was set up called the Salon des Refusés. And this painting was the be-all and end-all of that salon, of that, the Refusé. And it was people went there and they laughed themselves sick. It was disgusting, appalling. I mean, it's quite clear this girl's taken her clothes off and the men are fully dressed. Shock, horror. And you know, they're definitely in Paris. You can see that by everything, their clothes. It's a bit like having two people in Nike trainers and, uh, I don't know, whatever these kids wear nowadays, hoodies, talking to a girl in the middle of Green Park who's taken absolutely everything off and doesn't care, because she's looking straight at you, so she knows you're there. And everybody, by the way, for this afternoon, you're all male. Everybody in this room is male. Point is, the art viewing public was perceived to be male. The art world was male. So it's, it's completely shocking, and uh, nobody has really understood it, except, of course, people abused it because it was so crudely painted, apart from everything else. Here are two men with a girl that's naked. Now, we're going to look at this, we're going to break it down, so everybody wait, be on your toes. First of all, the setting. Manet is inspired or encouraged by the Barbizon painters, right? And Theodore Rousseau is one of the leading Barbizon painters. This is his pool in the forest from the early 1850s, so about 13 years earlier. And this painting completely ticks all the boxes for classical composition. You have plenty of horizontals, which give stability. You have the verticals, and you have the light gathering in the center like that. You have a, 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 a road, a path of light taking to the middle. It's all very, very classical, in composition, I mean. If we think that we can try putting Manet in, let's see what happens. So we put Manet in there, and it works perfectly. What I'm trying to say is, that is a clue that Manet was responding to classical ideas, even though the theme was so different. Now, he drew some of his ideas from an engraving which is based on a design by Raphael. So this is by Marc Antonio Raimondi, and it was from this, probably this engraving, that he got the composition right down here. By the way, I can't see this at all, because I'm right here, so you have to look, but there you can see it. That gave him the idea of melding the figures with the legs intertwined. But more than that, Manet trained himself by going to the Louvre. And in the Louvre, he saw the wonderful painting by Giorgione. It's called the Concert Champert. <clears throat> in studying this painting, I think that he got a very good idea, an idea that nobody else got, particularly the committee at the Salon, they didn't get it either. When you look at this painting, you see there are two men in the middle, a courtier with a lyre, and a young shepherd. And there are two women who are naked. One has got a slight classical thing around here, but basically two women that are naked. Point is, they are, the way the composition works is like this. By the way, am I shouting, or are you okay? I, I had a very tense morning, so I, I might be shouting a bit, but okay. So we look there. Here are these two men, and they're talking in deep conversation, and they're the same scale, and they're slightly recessed into the painting in the, in the center. Then we have these two. These two figures are right on the picture plane. The picture plane, by the way, is this. The picture plane is the surface of the painting. Recession is when the image goes into the illusion of recession back in through the canvas, recession, Right, that starts with the Renaissance. And then when you get to the Baroque, you get the idea of the image coming out into our space, projecting outward. But these figures are right on the picture plane, their feet are right down here, and they're much bigger if they stood up. I looked at that, having done this little drawing, I thought, mm-mm, they don't belong together, definitely not. How about looking at what these women could symbolize? First of all, women the flute. So we know that a flute is, tends to have sexual connotations. That goes back to the 
um, the double aulas that the Greek courtesans would play at the symposia in ancient Athens. They played the flute. And if we look for one, which I can do very easily, I'll show you right there, this girl who's a hetaira is playing a double aulas completely naked and it tells you straight away that she's, um, she is a courtesan or a prostitute. In other words, she's, she represents sexual love, just to be quite plain. The other girl here is, has white, is wearing white, always a symbol of purity, and she's lifting water in a jug. That is an image, all those images suggest purity. And if we go to our painting, we find the woman at the back is bending down with a jug of water, lifting up a jug of water, and wearing white, which is slipping off her shoulder. I th and of course the attitude of bending is also an attitude of humility. So you've got the humility, you've got the whiteness, you've got the water, and this woman is an image of purity. Do you see where I think I'm going? Even if you don't think I'm going there. <laughs> well, <laughs> I remember the end of one of those Fellini films. It might have been Satyricon, or one of those great films, where as a girl, she walks into the water and she comes right towards the camera carrying a glass of water. Anybody remember that? It's the same idea. I think, therefore, that the two men are alone. And I think the women don't exist. I think the women are figments of their imagination. I think the women are there to tell us what they're talking about. And what they're talking about is the two aspects of women. Uh, love, sacred, and profane. It seems blindingly obvious now that I've seen it that that's what the painting is about. And that's very typical for the high renaissance, a conceit, something that people will unravel for themselves. We don't see the women Sorry, we see the women, but they don't, because the women aren't really there. Now take that back and put it into the Manet. Can we say the same thing? Can we say that the two men are talking to each other and they are talking about love, sacred, and profane? This woman representing profane love and that one representing sacred love. Are we happy-ish? Well, in order to make my point, you see the sad thing is if I can make a Hillary detour, sad thing is that after the French Revolution, all these great intellectuals, it was so, France was so messed up, the people on the committee wouldn't have had the education to see all of this and work it all out. But when you look at this woman here, you see the basket is tipped up, okay? Now, a tipped up vase in Renaissance iconography, which Manet knew, a tipped up vase indicates lost virginity or spilled virginity. This is actually Ariadne from Titian's Bacchus and Ariadne in the National Gallery. And you see the amphora is tipped up to tell us, just like we didn't know actually, that Theseus, who abducted her, had done whatever Theseus thought he might do and abandoned her on the island of Naxos. In other words, the tipped up vase and the tipped up basket say the same thing. In contrast, the vase that isn't tipped up, the vase with a lid, tells of purity. So you see here in this little slip from Van Eyck's adoration, uh, a vase there telling us of the Virgin's purity. Okay, so now I think you've got the idea that I see the painting as an allegory. I see that it was a very clever painting. It's actually classical with a small c. You've got a triangular composition here. Uh, you've got stability. You've got the two sort of wings of the stage. They're, they're sort of placed in a stage. You have the light gathering in the center. And in many ways, it is really quite a classical composition. However, poor Manet was completely derided. But then, nonetheless, he went on in the very same year to make the Olympia. Now, both of these paintings might not have happened in the way they did without him going for a walk one day through Paris and seeing a very, very small girl walking along swinging a guitar. She had red hair and she was tiny and she had this huge big guitar, and she was going to go off and give somebody a music lesson. And her name was Victorine, and here she is. Um, Victorine Muron, there she is, and here she is with a parrot. It was Victorine that posed for both of these paintings and many others, and really was his muse. So there she is again. You see her in the Olympia, and there you see her in the Dejeuner, the same girl. Um, 
So she was born in Paris in 1844 from a working class family. Her father might have been an engraver and her mother was a milliner, but she was very gifted musically and she gave um, lessons in, in guitar and, and violin. And she wished to be a painter as well. Wonderfully, she became good enough to be accepted by the Salon, even in years when Manet was refused, which is rather, rather interesting. Of course, people said horrible things about her, and they introduced her as Olympia, you know. Uh, uh, but here she is. Now, this little painting she made herself. It's the only painting that exists that she actually made herself, called Palm Sunday. And so she survived, and she lived a long life, which tells me that whatever you like to think, she was not Manet's mistress, because, well, she wouldn't have survived. She would have got ill. She would have been ill. Um, so we see her now in Olympia, the great, the great painting Olympia, which scandalized Paris in the same year. And this painting was a painting that lacked idealism. That's unforgivable in Paris. And that rankled the viewers. It just didn't tick the boxes. She's definitely not a goddess, okay? And she's definitely not even a nymph. She's not ashamed. For goodness sake, at least she'd have the decency not to look at us. I mean, we're all men, remember? And if she should take off her bracelet and her shoes and her thing and be a proper nude. Now, the difference between a nude and a naked woman, you can tell all your people at the next dinner party. A nude is a classical concept. You look at a nude woman a bit like a landscape. A naked woman is a woman who took her clothes off. And this woman took her clothes off. She's got her slippers on, her bracelet, her necklace, and she's got earrings and flower, and she is just a girl who took her clothes off. But she's got an absolutely awful little body, doesn't tick any of the right um, boxes at all, and you contrast her with the marvelous purity, the attitude of service, the kindness, the decency, and the lack of judgment, the unjudgmental attitude of the servant here holding a bouquet of flowers, representing purity, also telling us that she doesn't need you because she just had a male lover five minutes ago and he sent the flowers. Plus, her servant is wearing white. So it's a painting which works on lots and lots and lots of levels. You've got the black cat, which is also a symbol of sexuality. And her gesture particularly is important. This was called a frog gesture, and it was, um, it was an invitation rather than an attitude of modesty. Well, it was attacked to bits, yellow-bellied courtesan, female gorilla made of India rubber, outlined in black, the queen of spades after her bath, a parcel of nude flesh or a bundle of laundry, a triumph of vulgarity. And it was only saved from being physically ripped to bits by being hung very high up on the wall. It's not totally, it's not totally funny. Do we go back to her? Let me just see. Yes, I, I just wanted to say it's not totally funny. The point is that she was highlighting a very big issue in Paris, which was the issue of syphilis, which was simply hovering over every family in France, particularly Paris. There were thousands and thousands of prostitutes. These poor girls came in from the city where there was no work in the country, and they were sucked up into this, and syphilis was rife, and it hovered as a real terror over every family in France. Here was this girl blatantly strutting her stuff. Manet was really making a very political remark. But when we see her origins, we see they're perfectly different. First of all, the naked Maya by Goya had already caused terrible ructions, and the Inquisition, which still existed, amazingly enough, came in and interviewed him. They wanted to know who'd commissioned the work, um, this work caused a tremendous amount of, of upset, which went on for, century, for, for decades. In the early 20th century, the Spanish decided to forgive and forget, and they produced a postage stamp with the naked Maya on, and in America, the command went out from on high, any letter that comes from Spain with the naked Maya stamp must be returned. We want to keep America scrubbed and clean. So the naked buyer who looks a bit like a guitar, favorite instrument of the Spaniards, you see here she's looking at you. But you go back then to some of the classical models and you see 
the Giorgione that's leaving Venus, you really are invited to look at her as if she's a landscape. She is just, she's got these marvelous curves and rhythms, the proportions are slightly elongated, obviously the head's a bit small, and above all, key thing, does she look at us? Does she look at us? No, right. So there's no question of interaction between us and her. She is there, plus she's got the arm raised, it's quite, that is all part of the rhythm of the composition, and she's lying on a red pillow, which is quite um, passionate. But when I look at the background of this, I know that it's a bit sad, because Georgie only died in the plague, and Titian finished the painting, and how do I know that? I know that because I'm looking at this little bit here. Can, I can't really see. Can you see this house, this corner, this little village? Can you see that? With the light coming on here. And you can see that, I can't see it, but you can see the zigzag path down there. Now, the thing is that, um, let me just make this up a little bit, actually. The thing is that that, I've seen that somewhere else. So I go sleuthing around, and I find it in this paint. There it is. I find that. And that is painted by Titian. I'll show you where it is. It's in that painting. So that painting is the Nole Me Tangere by Titian, painted in 1514. And you can see that he simply used the same thing. But when Titian makes his own Venus, the Venus of Orbino, she is now looking at us. The hand gesture, if you go back, is exactly the same. And she is looking at us. She has a slightly more sort of erotic attitude of the shoulder, the hair is more loose. If you go back, uh, the hair is tucked behind and it's brown. Now you've got blonde hair. Blonde hair is always associated with loose women. I mean, Satan himself is meant to be a male in the, gospel, in the Bible. In, in Genesis, Satan is a male. Turns out to be a blonde girl all the way through the Middle Ages. Um, so, and and uh, she's looking at us. So she, this is the one that is closest to the Olympia because you can see the red divan showing through right there. The servant at the back is slightly repositioned. These are the models. So now you can see very clearly that this again had classical roots, but the, but the, the committee was not happy with it at all. Now, the, at the very same year, in 1863, the same year that the Olympia caused a complete and utter shock, this painting was fine. It was gorgeous, wonderful. People went into, into ecstasies over it. Because Alexandre Carbonel was a um, salon painter. He had all the sable brushes, and he did what I call, I like to call the perfect diction. And he made this marvelous painting, and the girl is, has her arms raised, and she's actually making eye contact under her hand, which is very flirty. But look, she's lying on water. Well, women don't lie on water, so it's fine. It's absolutely fine because she's a goddess and she's not one of us. And very oddly, this painting was actually bought by Louis Philippe, the very person who um, chucked all those pictures out of the salon. This was bought by Louis Philippe. So you can see what a, what a, what a, what a mixed bag of attitudes going on. Oh, I should have warned you about that. We're going to go back to Courbet. Um, Gustave Courbet, who was the great realist, and also a bit of a far brand. He's the one that pulled down the column in the Place Vendôme, and he ended up running away, or had to go to Switzerland because of massive fines. He wanted to continue this trend, and just a few years later, he made a painting of two girls totally naked. You remember the ones I showed you on the bank of the Seine? So this is where it leads to, you see. So now he's got these two girls. And they are called the sleepers. And you have the blonde one and the dark one, one with a very pale skin, one slightly more um, ochre skin, flowers. And this painting, uh, again, was the sort of thing that was beginning to appear to a shocked Parisian audience. Um, so you can go and see this if you want to. So we go on to change the subject. Manet changes gear in 1864. One piece of research that I can't do, I cannot do, it's impossible, is to find out when he knew he was going to die. I think he might have had, I might have found out in 1864. Because in 1864, he made great images of death. Besides, I want to show you some male figures. So this is a dead Toreador. It was part of a very much bigger painting that went up here. And it's an extraordinary image of 
of finality. Again, it's very, very Spanish, the black and the white, the stasis of it, stasis, and the pathos of this very, very handsome man. Um, and it was, uh, the painting was called Incident in the Bullring, exhibited in 1864. And this one was fine for the salon, as you can see. So Manet at this stage suddenly begins to meditate on death. And then he makes one of the, I think, greatest paintings of the 19th century. Um, it's in New York and it's very big. I'm, going to, I'm sure you don't know it. I hope you don't because I want to show you. And it's called The Dead Christ of the Angels. Um, if you saw it, you might not think the Manet, who did the Olympia and the Dergenet, would do this. It's this painting, and it's about the size of the projection here. And this is an extraordinary painting made the same year. Um, you have three levels of consciousness. You have the conscious angel swooping down with her petrol blue wings. You see, the wind is blowing. That's why her hair is blowing. Her dress, her robe is blowing. This is quite Baroque. Her dress is flying up. Her beautiful blue wings. A consciousness um, swooning, somebody unconscious, and then the death, complete finality. So you have these, this descending uh, sort of spiral of consciousness as the angels gather around the figure of the dead Christ. And when he made this painting, which is the only painting I've ever seen of Christ with body hair, he put the wound on the side where the heart is, right there. Charles Baudelaire, who was a great friend, wrote to him straight away and said, stop, stop, stop. Take it back, change it. You've made a mistake. People are going to use that petty, petty excuse to rip this picture to bits. Take it away, change it. The wound has to be on this side. Right? He said, I've done what I've done, that's that, and he didn't. But um, it's all, it's, when you look at this painting now, and you see there are some precedents. He didn't invent the composition. You can see the composition in this work by Giovanni Bellini, The Dead Christ Supported with Angels, and it's one of our ones in the National Gallery. So the idea of meditating on this figure of Christ was a known composition. It's just that Manet modernized it by using a real person, if you like. Another one here, also by Bellini, it was quite a common composition. But when we go back to the painting, we see that Manet has presented, maybe himself, um, as an emperor and a king enthroned. This figure is enthroned, in, swathed, in a throne, in swathed with robes, with one foot slightly forward and one foot slightly back, the attitude is regal, and it reminds us absolutely of the Roman emperors, particularly Augustus, who promoted himself via great public sculptures. And in all the sculptures you see Augustus like that, very, very half naked, and with one foot forward and one foot back, um, you can see what I'm trying to say, yeah? Now, Augustus holds up the scroll of the good law, but in the case of this figure here, you don't have that. You have the hands are empty in a sort of offering. So the hands are offering, but there's nothing more to offer. And the mouth is open, but there's nothing more to say. Even the eyes are open. And you just see in the... I'll just go back so you can see the whole thing again. Um, the uplighting is what makes it so very, very dramatic, that it's lit up from below. Um, people ac accused him of painting a dead coal miner, he was attacked up and down Dale for the painting. But this is truly in the, in the completely in line with the works of the great masters, somebody like Guercino, for example, would paint, like, even using Guercino's colors, actually. So it's an amazing painting of power and majesty. A, a frontal figure always has control and power over the people, in a sense. It has a regal sense. It is a seated figure. Um, it is a majestic figure. So um, he made an etching which is really terrifying because of the expression on the face. So we go on to Cezanne 20 years later, painting male figures. And again, Cezanne is trying to work back towards the classical or pre-classical model, not particularly successfully, I have to say. But who am I to criticize Cezanne? Um, you see that he's thinking about the Arche Curai, the Arche Curai, these very stratified um, bodies. Of course, they were made in very hard stone, 
and this is long before naturalism had really come into its own. They are very Egyptian in their attitude. You can see there's no contrapposto at all. Um, through the influence of Cezanne, then, Picasso goes back to the classical model as well. I'm just showing you some male figures. But now let's go on back to Manet. Manet style changes in the 70s. We've now 10 years on. And he paints the brunette in a very loose way, mouth slightly open, eyes very alert, soft, softly painted, but nevertheless retaining quite a lot of the Spanish feel, the black and white feel. And you will see that a few years later, the style has completely changed to a true impressionist style with a lighter palette, high color key, loose brushwork. So you can just see as you look how you can see that they are very different. Now we're going to just look at Degas. And Degas, of course, was a great, great figure painter. You see him in these two compositions on the left uh, in a, a sort of a salon type portrait where the light is falling from one side, one side of the face is dark, and the face has a very high finish to his more impressionistic work on the, on the, on the, on the right hand side. But his style, his painting was superlative. He's painting this face almost as if it's wet clay, all the brushwork describing the form. He's not so much worried about the outside and the outline, he's worried about the form. And you can see this is painted by somebody who works in clay or wax. He was, you can see the two styles very, very clearly here, that Degas was the one who took Impressionism forward. His compositions were also very, very um, irregular. And uh, this composition is typical of Degas, to have something sort of surging across the canvas in a strong diagonal. Um, no real reason for that. Plus, the warm colors are very typical of him as well. I wanted to show you some things that you might not have seen, you see. But of course, ballet was his passion for everything that it in included. So the precision, the discipline, the order, and the beauty of ballet is the thing that inspired him most. And he made many drawings and many, many pastels and paintings of dancers. But he often made them in un, uh, not in balletic poses at all, just in natural resting poses, as you see in this drawing here. Again, the composition works on these two diagonals going up, and then one diagonal going this way. I mean, all his work is so original in terms of composition. This one as well, we've got the same thing. A tremendous diagonal goes up and across, but the horizontal of the feet sort of cuts it off up there. His colors are also completely original. People massively underestimate Degas. They just think ballet dancers, done and dusted. It's not, he is an extraordinary painter. Again, if I wanted to really go into this, you've got all the diagonals coming in, the horizontal from the feet echoed by that very strong line at the top there, and the green just balancing off the oranges. So the dancers that he painted were called the little rats, and they were all girls, young girls, mostly from just working class girls, and they were, they were trained to be the dancers at the ballet, Les Petits Rats. And he, they were the subjects of very many of his works. The blue dancers would be done in pastel, as you can see, and doing the kind of attitudes that they did, he was enormously interested in the twist of the head, the movement of the shoulders, and in the kind of attitudes that dancers can, can get into. And it's a very flat composition. It doesn't have any real recession. So to do these compositions properly, he wanted to have real evidence. So he got his camera out. He was one of the first artists to use cameras. And this is one of his photographs. So it shows you how the, the dancer is posing. He's taking his little crackly little uh, photograph, and then he's using it in the thing. Can you see that? But it's reversed. So another one is this. There's a photograph here. It shows the dancer with her arm outstretched. He uses that attitude in this there. You can see it. So it's very, very easy to see his work, work in progress. Um, when he wanted to have a corps de ballet, he, he made tracings of a figure and then would trace them. So he would trace them across the page. He'd do one and he'd trace them. It's another way he worked. And of course, also, he worked by making his own pastels. He made his own oil pastels, and I understood 
that he heated them. And something to do with the heating maybe relaxed the oil a bit, and that's why you get these tremendous strong um, sort of attacks with the oil pastel. So I can't resist just lightening the mood a bit because I have just luckily I've just met the chairman of the Cape Town Ballet just before the lecture and I'm thrilled that I'd already put these dancers in. I wanted to show you a wonderful dance troupe called the Trox. Has anybody heard of the Trox? You haven't. They're the Trox. It's the Ballet Trocadero of Monte Carlo. Nothing wants ever to do with Monte Carlo, Rosie, if you're there, wherever you are. Uh, and they are all male. And they're all incredible classical ballerinas. And they wear their point size 14 or size 12 point shoes. Um, and this is, oh no, sorry, why are they not here? They have to be here. Perhaps a bit further on. Sorry, we just have to wait. Um, in doing these, these dances, the most famous one is the dancer of 14 years, who stands with her arms behind her. These are some of the studies for her. But she was a real person, a little Belgian girl called Marie Genevieve van Gotham, and she goes straight into history. The work was very upsetting to people. I think it had a fetishistic atmosphere because he put, he put the dancer into a real tutu and he put a real ribbon on her hair. And she might have had real bad issues as well. And that smacked of something not quite healthy, I feel. Uh, critics compared the dancer to a monkey and to an Aztec, called her the flower of precocious depravity. Um, and look at the face. They saw her as marked by the hateful promise of every vice, bearing the signs of profound and a heinous character. She was absolutely, because people felt there was something unhealthy, that this old man was making this 14-year-old and dressing her up like a real person. So anyway, she gave up ballet very quickly and disappeared. We don't know what happened to her. Um, but the beautiful dances that he made out of clay and that were cast in bronze or made out of wax have all got these incredible floating tension. They are absolutely exquisite. And I think it's now that I'm going to show you the dances of the Trocadero doing the dying swan. Um, yeah, no, not quite. Perhaps I didn't put them in after all. Uh, of course, a wonderful arabesque coming down like that. Typical Degas bronze. Um, here she is doing the... The, this is the great um, dance that was made famous by Anna Pavlova. It is the dying swan. And this is one of the dancers from the Trocadero, the Trox as they're called. Here's another one. And they're always slightly funny, so his, his tutu is falling to bits because it's feathers. But I can't tell you what fun it is to go to their ballets. You should invite them to Cape Town tomorrow. They're absolutely amazing. They're very, very good dancers. They've got more power and strength than girl dancers, actually. So back to Degas, he famously painted Miss Lala swinging around in the air from her teeth. And this is the pastel, which has slightly more movement than the actual painting. Now, it, he went there four nights to see her performing in this pink circus. It wasn't really a tent. It was like a great big hall. Everybody went to the, went to the circus all the time. Gertrude Stein went all the time. Picasso and all his friends went all the time because they lived just up the road. The Cirque Pedrano was at the bottom of the hill of Montmartre and everybody went all the time. And it was really a great place. That's why Picasso made all his acrobat paintings. And uh, one of the people they went to see was Miss Lala, who was the girl you've just seen, hanging by her teeth. And I thought you might be intrigued because... There she is. She lives in the National Gallery forever in London, and nobody ever, ever asked who she was. All they say is, it's Degas. Well, why not give the girl a bit of publicity? Miss Lala was born as Anna Olga Albertina Brown, and she was born in a German but now Polish city, which is interesting. So she was known as Olga Kyra, Olga the Mulatto, Olga the Negress, the Venus of the Tropics, the Cannon Woman, and the African Princess. And she was part of the famous Folie Berger. There she is, the real photo. She could lift a cannon with her teeth. She could also lift an adult man holding a boy with her teeth. So the point was that Degas was actually of mixed race himself. Many people don't realize that. His mother was Creole. And in his younger brother, I think you see it slightly more uh, clearly, 
of the sort of olivey skin and the eyes and the dark eyes. So he loved Miss Lala and he made the painting. Later on, as he got older, he retreated to his studio, which was a tip. There was a, there was a narrow path which you could sort of, you could just walk like this into the center where there was a little raised platform where his model would be. And the rest of it was a total tip. And he wouldn't let anybody in except, except um, Julie Manet. Oh, she was the only person who was allowed to go in. And he painted these women in the bath in all these very peculiar poses and very awkward and angular. As again, you get the extraordinary compositions, the, the, the diagonal composition. I don't know if I mentioned yesterday, I think I did, that diagonals in paintings gives a painting aggression. Did I mention? Or was that the day before? Um, diagonals, any diagonals in a painting, give the painting instability and aggression. That's why there's so many in Picasso's work. But you get these women in these incredibly awkward attitudes, um, giving the extraordinary composition, but also a sense that we're seeing a woman as an animal. This is a woman as an animal. She is, now he photographs her, you see. He's got lots of photographs to show how the back moves when they bend over like that. And uh, she bends down, she stoops down in an attitude of humility. This particular attitude was copied by Picasso as well. Um, mainly, that's a very, very awkward attitude you see from the back view, and you don't see her face, and you don't see her eyes. I'm just going to go back to this one. Every one of these, and there are many, you never, ever see the face, and you never see the eyes. She doesn't really know that you're there. She's an animal, sort of like a cat licking itself. She's an animal that's awkward. She doesn't... She certainly has no concept that somebody's looking at her and she is not a beautiful woman or anything else. She's an animal. You see, Degas had a very, very difficult relationship because he never had any relationships with women or men, I don't think. But the point was, he, he was absolutely obsessed with women. But the, the idea that they might look at him... So it's a bit like you're looking through a peephole in the bathroom door the whole time and you're seeing these figures and they don't know that you're there. Sometimes when he was busy doing his wonderful um, pastels, he'd put the music on, and the music he loved most, because he came from a very musical family, was Gluck's Orpheus and Eurydice. And he used to sing, he used to dance around in any space he could find, in the, with his model singing, Do ve andro. You probably know that. I'm not, not even going to try to do the rest of it. So he would sing that lovely song, and you see very, it's painful to think about Degas. When he's about 50, he wrote to Monet and he said, pretty much, why can't I be normal, you know? So it's, 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 it is sad. Anyway, they are amazing works. And again, the composition, the curve here, echoing curve of the bath, all the diagonals, and that is Monet. I mean, Degas. He also made quite a nice lot of monoprints, and I like monoprints. That means you just get one impress. And here you see the girl kneeling and combing down her hair. That attitude of, she's, he's obsessed with hair. So was Renoir. Renoir made any number of naked girls with long hair that they were combing and playing with. Um, hair is something that really obsessed Degas as well. This painting is in the National Gallery. It's entirely red. And the angles of the elbows give it quite a lot of, um, an attitude of pain and anxiety. Um, and, and, you know, these, these angular, it's very, very angular. And the woman seems to be cringing up. She's holding her head while the maid is combing through this red hair. The fact that he did the entire painting red was something that was picked up quite quickly by Matisse. And you know about the Matisse, many of his paintings have got a completely red background. Degas' combing of the hair is quite interesting for that, for all the heat and for the angularity and for the technique that this is just one line down here across, back and down and down. And that's one paint stroke. That's also one paint stroke. So um, Degas has this extraordinary relationship with women and the uh, extraordinary need to paint them in, in attitudes almost of pain, um, where they, don't, they are not presenting themselves, they are not objects of beauty, and they don't even know that they're being seen. Another one of women combing their hair from 1894, um, the private collection. 
you, the, again, you have all the same things I've told you about, the angularity, the awkwardness, the fact that you don't see the face and you don't see the eyes. I, I did actually go back as far as Gercino, where I found a drawing, which I knew existed already, of girls drying their hair in the sun. Um, so there, it's quite a theme through art, this idea of the combing out of the hair. <clears throat> so really, I think all of these artists were showing us, first of all, we started with a very classical view, if you remember. Inside the studio, you arrange the woman. The woman is an object, desexualized completely, an objective thing. You arrange in the studio, arrange the lighting, you give it a meaning which is not to do with our world, and, and off you go. That's fine. From that, we then moved, the nude moved out of the studio to the public park, where she takes off her clothes in public, causes a sensation, but she is now, she is, it's an allegorical nude, which people didn't understand. We went through the Manet, we looked at the Dergenet Soulaire. We then moved on to Olympia, which was a blatant, blatant um, political statement about syphilis that was riding rough through Paris, and many people got it, including Manet himself. And I think I told you yesterday, but I think for the sake of the people that didn't come, I might mention that Manet died very young at the age of 51. He had advanced syphilis, and it was decided that he had to have his leg amputated. Um, he was put on his own dining room table with his brother, Edmund Manet, and two doctors and three students, and they cut sword off his leg on his own dining table. And he might have had a whiff of chloroform on a hanky. I think he did, actually. Point was, the wound went septic and he had gangrene. And he had absolute agony for 10 days, during which all he could do was paint these tiny, tiny flowers, which I showed everybody yesterday. Little tiny, tiny things. And then he died. Now, when he died, it was the end of the, uh, you know, the whole of Paris was distraught. 500 people followed the coffin. Monet was one of the people that carried the coffin, and Monet stopped work for a year, people don't know this, because he wanted to raise money for, to buy the Olympia for the state, because he thought, and he wanted to give the money to Manet's widow, Suzanne. For a whole year, Monet, who was a workaholic, stopped completely. He wrote letters, and he wrote letters, and he lobbied, and he lobbied, and he wrote, 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 and he collected a lot of money, 20,000 francs or something, to buy Olympia, which he did, and so it went into the museum in the Luxembourg Gardens. And of course, it went on to greatness from there. But he did that, and that was his respect for Manet. Most people don't know that Manet did that. Anyway, when Manet dies, he is the link with the classical world. He is really the last of the great, great classical painters, whatever the people say. After that, it's a free for all. Degas is breaking all the rules. Degas is going towards almost towards barbarism and primitivism. He's turning these women into monstrous beings. We're going to see much more of that tomorrow. And we're moving towards the fin de siècle. And everything that's held Western art together is slowly disappearing. So we're going to, that's what we're going to do tomorrow. And I just wanted to end with this picture. This is where we start, with uh, referencing the classical world, referencing the Venuses of, of the 5th century and 4th century BC, and we end with that, something entirely different. Okay, so that's for today. Tomorrow we're going to go on with how this anti-classicism edges towards primitivism. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I want to say I'm really sorry if I went a bit fast. I'll try and go a bit more slowly tomorrow. Okay, wonderful, thanks.